Hello everyone, come on in, make yourself comfortable. We're gonna get started in about 45 seconds. So uh, get set to go. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. We're just going to give people uh, 20 more seconds to make themselves comfortable and then we'll kick off. All right, welcome to your July webinar. My name is Jeff Thurick. I'm a director of Australian Advice Network in Evalesco, and I'll be your host today. And I'm really excited to be joined by our expert guests live from the Sunshine Coast, uh, my fellow AAN director and AAN Investment Committee member, Mark Venter. Thanks for joining me, Mark. Thank you, Jeff. Pleasure to be here. And, uh, it's a bit, bit warmer up there than it is uh, Sydney today. At least we've got some sunshine, though. No, we've got a great day up here. Yeah, we'll happily stay here, thanks. <laughs> Very good. So we've got a lot to talk about today around um, what's happening in investment markets, what's been happening in the previous six to 12 months, uh, where to next and how we go about constructing portfolios for the long term. Um, but before we get into our conversation today, I'd just like to let everybody at home know that today you're on mute so and your video is turned off so we can't see or hear you. So feel free to move around and talk amongst yourselves at home. Um, we do would love for you to be asking some questions as we go through. So you can see on the screen here, if you click on the Q&A button where the tick is and type in any questions, we'll try to get to those along the way through. Or if we don't get to them during the, the chat, we'll, we'll come back to them at the end of the session. Also, just to let you know, most of today's information will be around uh, general investment markets and, and concepts. Uh, and as such, shouldn't be regarded as personal advice. So even though many of our many of you in attendance are clients of AAN, Evalesco or Guide, um, we're not taking into account your personal circumstances at the moment. So if you would like to discuss how this may impact you personally, please do get in touch with Mark or myself or your advisor. So what we're going to go through, as, as we said in the invitation that you've all accepted, is the financial year in review. So look a little bit beyond some of the headlines. Uh, where to next for investment markets. So we'll dust off the crystal ball and see what we can come up with there. Uh, and also intertwining into that conversation, how we construct portfolios for the long term. And we're going to start by running through a few uh, tables and charts to, to sort of guide us through some of this initial conversation. So the first one uh, is a pretty damning chart uh, when you look at the, the numbers on the end of that table. Um, but really encapsulates what we've seen, particularly over the last six months. So to kick us off, Mark, maybe have a bit of a chat about this table and, and what we're seeing. Yeah, look, thanks, Jeff. It's um, basically what we're looking at here is a mostly what we would call a standard balanced portfolio. You've got 60% sitting in equities, 40% sitting in the safer sector of the market being bonds and cash or fixed interest and cash. And the first thing I think I know as you mentioned, Jeff, the last six months or 2022 year to date is pretty, uh, pretty ordinary uh, from a returns point of view, but there's a lot of green on that table. Uh, going all the way back to 1977, there's a lot more green, obviously, than red being positive returns. Uh, we had the big blip in 2008 with the GFC, uh, where for the whole year, um, the returns were negative 20% for a balanced type of portfolio, or what we at AN would consider to be around a balanced portfolio. Uh, then in 2022, year to date, obviously only six months in, uh, and we're sitting with a, a negative 16% return for a similar portfolio. Um, but there's been a number of different things that have uh, occurred this year, which have uh, uh, translated to that negative return for the six months so far. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to dig into those uh, a little bit more over the next couple of charts. I guess... Yeah, you touched on it, Mark, but the, the bond part, so the 40% of this portfolio, this is this is based on US numbers, but translates pretty well to, to global and, and Australian numbers. But the bond part is typically the more conservative um, 
stabilizing impact on, on portfolios over the longer term. Um, but, you know, bonds have been hit really hard in the first six months of this year as well. And we've got a couple of the charts which kind of show some examples of that. Um, yeah, so this is, um, this is China, one of the bonds is from uh, the largest property developer in China. Um, and China's got some unique problems going on in their property space at the moment, which is not being talked about much in the marketplace. Um, and this is a, a bond that you can see there back in 2019, 2020, trading at about $110, which is a little bit above what they would call par or equal fair value for a bond, which is generally 100. Um, and then you can see since middle of 2021 probably sort of around october it started to fall away to the point now where it's sitting at half of what is considered to be a, a fair value or a par value for a bond um, showing that there's some uh, some concerns in china with property and and whether uh, you'll actually get your money paid back on these sort of investments uh, over there um, so that's that's been that space in particular and as i said china's a bit more unique fortunately we don't have any of this exposure within our portfolio but there is some concerns uh, in the Chinese bond market. And this is more of a, uh, uh, a chart that shows our port or what's occurred in the general bond market. Um, and you can see in the Australian bond market there, uh, the pink or ready pink line um, over the course of the last 12 months, that's actually down uh, at some points beyond or per further than 10% negative, which is substantial movements for bonds. Um, and that's, that's cool. yeah, that, that has been part of what has been the difficulty this year from a returns perspective is that bonds, as you were saying, Jeff, is usually part of the portfolio that would, in a down market for shares, you'd expect to see a bit of upside or a bit of stabilisation. And we haven't seen that this year. We've actually seen uh, quite a negative return for bonds. And what's been driving, I guess we're going to talk about all the asset classes, but from a bond viewpoint, what's been driving that? Um, those challenges? So the bond market really started to move, as you can see there in around October, and that was when uh, interest rate discussion or inflation discussions were starting to, be, to occur. And the concern around inflation is that if inflation starts to increase too much, the central bank's main measure of trying to pull that back is to increase rates. And with rates being at historically low levels, bonds have been um, hit hard on the back of rates expected to go up because if you have a bond that's paying you 1% but then suddenly rates move up to 2%, your bond has to be worth less, worth less than what it was originally in order to pay that equivalent rate of return. And so with that inflation number starting to come through and in particular coming through uh, in early January, the main numbers came through and you can see the, uh, the grey line, that was when shares started to really fall. Uh, you had inflation numbers actually turning out in the US around the 8 to 9% mark. And prior to that, central banks have been telling us, don't worry about it. It's not going to be a concern. We're not worried about it. It's uh, effectively the word they were using was transitory. It's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, but suddenly the, uh, the numbers came in and it didn't look like it was going to be very transitory. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I saw this. This graphic in the paper yesterday in a Ross Gittins col column, which um, talked about the challenges of inflation and, and sort of what we were just talking about there. Um, and, you know, I, I think part of the, the article that he was writing and part of the conversation we've had in, in preparation for this is it's, it's a difficult time at the moment because inflation is not coming through in the way it typically has uh, when we have high inflationary environments. It's quite different at the moment. Um, so maybe we can share. You can share a little bit about you know how where inflation is and how inflation is coming through into the, the market at the moment. Yeah, well, the main driver, as you, I mean, in that uh, pictorial, it shows you the stimulus there, and we've had that's kicked in in a big way. Obviously, once COVID hit back in 2020, uh, governments around the world were worried about what was going to happen, and uh, central banks uh, stepped in and started pumping massive amounts of stimulus into the market to the point where I think the numbers somewhere up towards the $30 trillion mark around the world uh, has been pumped into the global, uh, global system, which has in itself created uh, issues from a demand point of view and, and growth in the value of, of uh, stocks and property. Um, but then you've also had supply chain disruptions with the whole COVID side of things. So 
things went into lockdown. I think in most places around the world, we still haven't seen that fully open back up again. We're still uh, obviously seeing some um, issues in Australia getting supply through for a lot of things. I know cars you're waiting for generally nine, 12 months in some cases, probably more. Um, so there's still some issues there, which is then also creating some inflation uh, on the numbers side of things. Uh, but the, the demand, whilst it's there, I don't think it's what we're, and this is where you're alluding to there, Jeff, it's not um, the demand of an extremely strong growing economy. It's, it's demand that's been driven by this, I think one of our fellow directors called it sugar hit, being the, uh, the mm -hmm. stimulus side of things. Yep. And then also the demand being um, there because the supply is not meeting it at this stage as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where yeah, the challenge can come in in terms of uh, increasing interest rates is designed to slow down spending. And if we're not you know, seeing the money being spent in the typical areas, will increased interest rates actually result in a slowdown in spending or will that sort of drive us more into uh, a recession? Which is which has been talked about um, a fair bit. Um, so the inflation has been a really hot topic, and I, I think the other part of it is um, the other area we're seeing. You, you mentioned cars, but then you know fuel prices are mm. a really big one. The whole energy sector has, has been impacted pretty heavily, um, and a lot of that's been driven by um, the unexpected events over in the Ukraine, which which coincided with you know, already um, difficult markets as well. And I've got on the yeah, next with, slide. With, yeah, correct. And that's been the, the war in Ukraine, obviously, where um, Putin, President Putin, has been playing games there as well. Um, and I just heard, read something saying yesterday that they've reduced the gas supply uh, even further. You know, that they've reduced, I think it's Nord Stream 1 is their main gas supply that goes into Europe, was down to 40%, and they just reduced it yesterday down to 20%. So playing some games there, and that's obviously then create, creating some issues with inflation because pricing is then going up, um, and then also worrying about do we actually have enough energy uh, to yeah. keep factories and the like open. Yeah, and this is the, the chart that you sent through when we started discussing this, um, which really highlights some of that conversation. Yeah, um, price of energy going from 50 uh, on the chart to 350 in the space of just over 12 months, uh, and I think that's based on what I was looking at yesterday, it's gone up even further on, uh, on uh, the, the supply being halved again. So there's, there's some interesting um, issues there on that front. And, and as you say, I think that's, that's helped, helped Australia in some ways, obviously being that we're a resource nation and prices were up and, and some of our resource stocks did quite well initially um, when the, the Russia-Ukraine side of things kicked in. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's going to create some challenges going forward. It continues to drag on, uh, which is what we're seeing at the moment. Yeah. And so it's quite timely that we're having, you know, having this conversation in that yesterday, Australia's inflation figures you know, for the quarter were announced at 6.1%, which you know, was slightly under a couple of forecasts, but, but well ahead of uh, a lot of other forecasts and what it's been previously. Uh, and then last night, the uh, Fed Reserve announced their latest um, interest rates decision in, to, in, in America. Um, so, you know, what, what are the central banks doing and, and what could that mean, particularly for, I guess, bonds to start off with, but then we can talk about other asset classes as well. Yeah, look, the main central banks that we're obviously watching are the ones that impact uh, us quite a bit here and uh, obviously the Reserve Bank. Uh, and then we're watching the US and we're watching uh, the Euro sector as well. And, and uh, US and the Aussie are, are both in a, an increasing rates mode and, and quite rapidly compared to historical increases. Um, US care went up last night another 75 basis points or 0.75 of percent. That was uh, on the back of 0.75 the previous month. Uh, in Australia, there's talk of uh, a rate rise coming uh, early next month, uh, anywhere from 50 basis points or half a percent up to 1% potentially. Um, I know Canada, was the first uh, country to do a 1% rate rise about three or four weeks ago. Um, so we are seeing some, some substantial increases in rates, which is going to, it's going to hurt some people who have got a lot of debt on their books, obviously. It's going to help retirees who uh, finally get some returns for their cash. Um, but yeah, for those that have debt, uh, it's going to start to impact things quite significantly. Um, and then in Europe, we've seen 
they've been the laggard as far as rate increases are concerned. They've, they've seen the inflation coming through, but the, the rate increases have only just started over there. So we actually feel whilst, based on our research, whilst the, the Reserve Bank and, and Central Bank in America were, have, have probably started the rate rising uh, side of things a bit too late in our, in our view, especially when you look backwards, it's always easy to look backwards though. Um, now they're trying to play a game of catch up. And the concern going forward is how far are they going to push the rate increases to see some effect on, on bringing back inflation? And will that push us into more of a slowdown from an economic point of view? Yeah, absolutely. And what, do you, what does that mean in terms of, um, I guess, the fixed interest area? So the traditional bonds, as we've talked about, whenever interest rates go up, they still uh, suffer because you can get a, a better return elsewhere. Um, but what other sectors of the, I guess, fixed interest market are there that, that could benefit from these types of things outside of cash that we just touched on? Well, your term deposits obviously have gone up. Uh, you can get much better rates now. I think uh, I was looking at one the other day for upwards of 3% uh, for 12 months, which is something we haven't seen for a long period of time. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, even the annuity space, which is another space that we look at every now and again, I was talking to Jeff before, and uh, there's some annuities now that are paying almost 5% over a five-year period. Uh, that's a per annum return, uh, which, again, is a significant increase in what we've seen previously. So there are some, some positives in that safer space of the market, um, but it is impacting things uh, on the share side of things. It's impacted the bonds. Obviously, they, we've seen that sell-off there. Um, the question now on the bond space is, has that sell-off been overdone? in that it's now effect, it's uh, the greatest or the largest sell-off in something like 50 years. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got a chart coming up that shows the, uh, the, the change in bonds over a large period of time. And, and it is quite a significant change that we've seen in this last 12 months. Yep, that's right. Um, I think the other area that you know, is potentially now coming to the fore is the, the floating rate bond space. So we've talked about the traditional long duration, which is, you know, the 10 year US government bond or the 10 year Aussie government bond has been um, hit pretty hard. And that was something that um, the AAN investment committee and, and portfolios moved away from that, um, that part of that market sort of early last year. So it has missed a lot of the pain in that sector, but it has been hard to find somewhere else to allocate that conservative part of the portfolio to. Yeah, we, um, we did. We made that move in June, uh, end of June last year. We were chatting a bit about the inflation piece in our investment committee meetings for a, a few months. And uh, we were concerned that there was potential for it to come through uh, at a much higher rate than what the central banks were trying to tell us was and it was going to be. So from our side of things, we wanted to be conservative and just make sure that we were taking the prudent approach there. Um, and we moved out of what we call passive uh, bond exposure or, or exposure to just the general bond market uh, to a more active based approach where we're actually using managers who cost a little bit more from a fees perspective, uh, but then are trying to manage that duration piece on the bonds just so that you don't feel the impact as much as you would on a passive bond market if we did see this inflation piece kick in and rates start to move up. So that has helped the portfolio. Uh, it still hasn't meant we've avoided negative returns, but the returns have been closer to uh, around the 2 to 3% mark rather than uh, 9, 10 and 11s uh, on a negative front. So it has, it has helped. Uh, obviously, we would like to have, it, it to have been more, uh, more in the positive range, as we always do, but it was good to see at least the, the change did help on that uh, protection piece. Yeah. And just touching on those, those overall returns, we showed the... Uh, you know, 60, 40 portfolio returns earlier and how they've been hit. But um, coming up to the end of the financial year, some of the super funds and, and various um, investment houses have been, you know, finalising their returns for the previous 12 months. We've seen a lot of negative numbers um, as to be expected through, you yeah. know, what we've been talking about and, and we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, I did read that there was only uh, one of the research houses said that there was three funds in the my super balance sector which is the you know 60 40 type portfolios um, traditionally that had a positive return out of all of their uh, surveyed uh, results so that's quite a big difference between you know having a slightly positive return to what we saw on the chart earlier of, of seriously negative returns what could be underlying some of those differences do you think 
Our view in that space is that it's generally the unlisted assets. So your um, industry funds in particular, uh, some of your bigger corporate super funds will have uh, investments in unlisted property um, or unlisted assets such as private equity. And those assets are generally not priced to market. So you don't get them priced like shares where every single day or every day the market's open, you're actually getting pricing occurring. So you know exactly what your portfolio has done from a true perspective of what the returns are. Whereas if you haven't been updating your price every single day, obviously the assets of property, private equity may not be reflecting the true value at that point in time of that asset. Um, and we, we've, we've seen that in the, in the past uh, when we've gone through similar cycles like this, uh, those sort of, those funds will hold up a bit better because of that unlisted space. But to us, it's not a true reflection of what's actually going on in that it's very hard to see any property uh, that hasn't dropped in value when you look at the listed property space has fallen quite a bit. And um, yeah. to think that other properties haven't fallen uh, or haven't seen some sort of uh, reduction in their prices probably possibly not a true reflection of where things are at. Yep, totally agree. If we look a little bit more at um, a more growth focused portfolio, so a similar chart to what we shared before, um, and this is a source from, from Vanguard and, and our, uh, our friend Hugh posted this recently, which sort of brought it to my attention as well. Um, so this is showing a, a 90 10 portfolio and this is this is an Australian version so this is 90 percent Australian shares 10 percent Australian bonds and how that's impacted um, before I, I let you sort of talk about it, the first thing that jumps out at me is again you know not that much red a lot more red red than uh, on the first slide but you know still a lot of green on there and particularly in recent times there was a long run of uh, green numbers um, for many years only interrupted by the COVID pandemic sort of impact of 2020 and now um, this year. What else jumps out at you from uh, this chart, Mark? Yeah, like I said, Jeff, I mean, it generally seems to be a good, good run of green numbers and then a couple of reds and uh, there seems to be a bit of a, a picture there on that front. So difficulty is obviously you don't know what the next year is going to bring and you never do. Um, but the thing that jumps out to me is, is the bond market return, which is that... Uh, the column just to the left of the green and red column. And you can see if you go back through all of those returns, there's never, there's only been two other negatives there. One was negative 0.8, which was last year. And the other one was back in 1994 of negative 1.1. I think, I don't think I'm missing anything there, Jeff. Um, which is significantly different to this year where we've seen negative 9.5, um, which is pretty close to in line with what shares have done for the year um, to date as well. If you look at that, a negative 10% number so that's meant that any portfolio hasn't had the protection that you would normally expect to see uh, from a bond market you look back there in 08 and 09 uh, you can see shares for those years negative 12 and negative 22 and yet the bond market for those two years was positive four and positive almost 11 and that obviously helped cushion the uh, the overall returns and, and just bring that up a little bit so you weren't feeling as negative but from a returns perspective, but the uh, this year we've seen negative in both those spaces, which has obviously translated to a, a negative return of pretty much what the stock market was. Yeah, and you can see it's interesting to look at the, the different um, figures. You can see the Australian share market has held up, you know, pretty well compared to peers. Um, returns last year in the Australian market were um, quite stellar, um, and we'll talk a little bit more sort of about that. Um, but I think one, one last thing just on, on the kind of the year in review, I suppose, is it's not just the traditional bond and equities that have um, been hit hard. We've also seen things like um, you know, cryptocurrency uh, has, has been absolutely hammered. And, and that's something that you know, we've never included in our portfolios. We know lots of people like to um, dabble in that. And, and we think that, you know, can have a role to play more from a very speculative end of the portfolio, but not something that, that we've put into the portfolios, but they've been hit very hard. And that's been interesting because that was often positioned as a bit of a hedge against normal equity markets or, or bond markets and, and quite uncorrelated. Um, that's proven not to be the case uh, over the last 12 months, but it is an unusual environment. So that may change going forward. But the other one is um, gold. So again, gold is often seen as that protection and hedge against um, 
you know, challenging times. And this chart shows a little bit of a different story this, this time uh, around what's happening in the gold market. Yeah, correct, Jeff. I mean, the, going back to the, the cryptocurrency discussion, I mean, cryptocurrency, obviously some people have seen some massive gains in that space for a, a number of years, but then this year uh, we've seen a Bitcoin uh, as the main cryptocurrency down almost 67% uh, as of today. Uh, from the peak uh, about six yeah. months ago. So that's been significant. And then looking at this chart, a lot of uh, there were uh, some commentary around cryptocurrencies being the new gold. Um, and we haven't really seen that translate. But even in the gold space, again, usually you would find gold being a pretty good space to be heading into when there's uncertainty and when you're seeing signs of uh, markets falling. However, as you can see here now, whilst this isn't the gold price, this is gold stocks in Australia. Um, they generally tend to follow the gold price fairly closely. And in this case, the last few months have been sold off. It's been sold off quite dramatically. Um, so we haven't, there hasn't even been safety in that space. Um, so it's been a, a unique market in that the only place where there has been some sort of safety has been cash, which at the start of the year, you were pretty much getting nothing for. Yeah, absolutely. So I mentioned briefly that, um, I'll skip through those ones for now and then I'll come back. The Aussie, Aussie market has held up pretty well for a long yes. period of time. And you can see here, this is the gray line being the overall diversified portfolio, the pinky line being the Aussie market um, held up really well until really quite recently. Uh, and, the, and the returns last year, it was a 30% return for the ASX 200. What has driven that and, you know, what what's uh, what's pulled the rug out from underneath it to see it fall so heavily in recent times? Yeah, the interesting part was last year, even at thirty uh, percent, it wasn't uh, the best part of our portfolio. In that uh, international equities actually performed better over that time frame, um, and Aussie actually lagged a little bit. But of late, this uh, that little all well, those spikes at the end there on the upside have been mainly the the resources and banking sector in Australia, which held up quite well up until recently. Um, resources of, obviously off the back of the, China, the uh, Ukraine uh, invasion and uh, uh, the banking sector generally finds a, a flight to say what we call a flight to safety. So you find in these sort of markets where people get a bit nervous, they'll usually move from what may be perceived as slightly higher risk stocks of in your mid cap space or your middle sized companies to the blue chip stocks of the banks and, and uh, the resources and the tel Telstra's and the Woolies and the like. Um, and they were holding up all right up until recently. And the, uh, the resources side has been, has fallen back on the back of resource prices. So iron ore has come back significantly. Um, and then the banking sector has, has fallen away on the back of potential bad debts uh, with the concern that if, if rates continue to rise up at a rapid uh, pace, then we're going to see some uh, bad debts enter into the marketplace and that'll obviously affect the banks to some degree. So again, markets trying to work out where to and what's happening in the future and that's what it's trying to price in and that's what we're seeing here in the short term. Um, longer term, banks haven't, they've, over the last 10 years, banks have been fairly flat. They've been up and down, but they've been a good safe place to be sitting for this last little little run up until the, the bad debt side of things start to kick in. Uh, from a portfolio perspective, going back to looking at Australian and international, we actually made the, uh, the decision as managers of, in the models to have an equal weighting. Um, you'll find some managers like Vanguard have actually a, a higher weighting towards international uh, shares due to the fact that our market is actually quite small when you compare it to the rest of the world. Uh, then a lot of managers and portfolios in Australia actually have a high weighting towards Australian shares being a home uh, basis bias. Uh, we decided to make the uh, decision that we would have an equal weighting uh, in the portfolio. Again, on the back of, we, we don't wanna have any hero calls. We don't wanna try and pick and choose. We wanna just say, well, let's have both in there equally. And then at times, like over the last six months, the Aussie's actually done well, and that's helped the portfolio compared to where the US uh, mid caps in particular have been. They've, they've sold off uh, down around 30% over the last six months. But prior to that, the US mid caps really helped the portfolio and pulled it up quite a bit because the Aussie was lagging a bit compared to those stocks. So by having an equal weighting, we then have uh, money in both of those spaces, which then helps to even out that return over time. 
Yep, makes sense. Thanks for running through that. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes left, so that gives us some time to, to talk about where to next. And, and I assume we'll, we'll probably get some more questions as we start talking through this. So anyone at home, if you've got questions as we start going through this section, please type them in the Q&A box uh, and, and we'd love to have a chat about those. Um, so as you, you touched on there, you know, we, we take a long-term focus and, and no hero calls uh, is an important part of it. Um, we've already talked a little bit about inflation and interest rates, but to summarise, what's the thinking and, you know, where do you think it's going to go uh, and, and what's the potential impact on portfolios? Crystal balling here, Jeff. Yeah. Um, look, firstly, we have been watching, one thing we've been watching recently has been currency. Uh, the Aussie dollar has fallen away a bit uh, whilst the rate rises in the US have been occurring. And we do watch that a little bit because there is a, a hedging strategy that we do employ at certain points of the pricing of the Aussie dollar. So we've been sitting with our a neutral hedging position within the portfolios, which means that we have about a 25% hedging exposure just to try and protect when currency moves, so that doesn't have as much of an impact on the portfolio from a, uh, adjusting the share return side of things. So we're watching currency. Uh, if we do see that start to fall further, we may look to then move into a higher hedge position so that when that does turn and then go back up again, we won't see a negative impact on portfolio. So we're watching that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been make, we've made some changes uh, to the underlying managers within the Australian share space in particular. Uh, we had uh, a, a growth bias in some of the stocks that were in the portfolio. They performed really well for a couple of years. We have seen them sold off uh, a bit lately. And so we did actually move out of there one, a lot of that space in uh, March and a bit more in May as well. So that we're now sitting with about 50% of the Australian share exposures in the top 20. Uh, so trying to lead into that, that flight to safety so, uh, piece where we've got that in the portfolio. Uh, we are talking to a manager to look at adding in um, a, a different, a slightly different style, which will help to protect uh, on the downside, but also complement the growth manager as we're traveling through various cycles. And then in the international space, we have actually added in uh, a, a fourth manager to move down the path of having a four pillar approach where we have um, uh, four managers in each of the Aussie shares on the international share space and Lazard. Uh, is that manager in that space, investing into more of your global franchises, so your big well-known brands. Um, and then we have Franklin Growth uh, Fund in there to help pick up some of the, the more growth-based option, options uh, in the portfolio. Because the thing is, whilst growth can be a bit more volatile, especially in times like this, over the long term, the growth numbers are pretty good. You look at stocks like Cochlear and CSL, which have gone from, and I was looking at the numbers just before, Cochlear was $50 10 years ago, now it's 200 CSL was 40 and now it's 300. Um, and you look at the old blue chips of the banks and they've pretty much gone nowhere. Westpac, I think, is sitting on about the same price as it was 10 years ago. Likewise, ANZ as well. CBA has done all right, um, but the others have, have pretty much trend, trended along sideways generally. So it's good to have some of those stocks in the portfolio that will hopefully pick up some good upside over the longer term. But as you said, it's with a long-term focus. Yep, makes a lot of sense. Um, and the talk around inflation and interest rates, obviously, as we touched on earlier, that you know rates have come through in recent times significantly higher than uh, what everybody thought they might be a few mm. months ago. Um, yeah, the, the, I guess the hope now is from an interest rate viewpoint that um, having maybe been a little bit slow, as you mentioned earlier, to, to react to it, having maybe um, put a little bit too much money into the, the market in, in previous times, they won't overreact on the other side. and. Um, and have too much of an impact by continuing to raise rates. We know, you know, certainly I, I don't think there's any doubt rates are going to go up more from here, mm. um, but potentially, you know, depending on who you listen to, um, maybe only a few more right, uh, raisings and then um, potentially late next year, they might start to, to trim them again if they get everything under control. So it's an interesting space to watch what's happening there. Um, for people with mortgages, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, if you've got a fixed rate at the moment, you're feeling pretty good about life. Um, but when that comes off, it'll be an interesting conversation to have and certainly um, suggest you reach out to a mortgage broker to have a chat about your options in that space. Um, we haven't talked much about um, residential property. 
where does, where does that fit? I don't think we talked about it at all. Where does that no. fit? Um, and, you know, obviously a big part of uh, Aussie conversations and, and um, big part of Aussie investments. Where does that fit and what are our thoughts on that? A huge part of Aussie conversation. I mean, Australians love residential property um, and it's a big play and we, and we don't mind it. I think it's a good investment to be looking at as well. But right now, uh, we've come off a point in time where I think most people will agree property was very much on an over, uh, on, a, on the high side. Um, we have your fair value, overvalued and undervalued sort of equations. I think property was very much overvalued and, and the increases in um, interest rates is starting to see that come back. And CoreLogic, who are one of the, uh, the researchers in that space that we utilised, back in May, they did a survey of properties around Australia. And at that point in time, 26% of the properties they looked at had seen some sort of decline in the price from those peaks. Uh, in June, they redid that survey. It was over 40% at that point in time had seen some sort of decline from those peaks. So I think we'll probably continue to see that. It's going to vary depending on the location. It always does, as they say, in property location, location, location. Um, but in general, I think we're, we're expecting to see that the interest rate rises will see property come back more to that fair value market and you will potentially start to see some bargains come into the place as well where you will have some um, property holders who have got too much debt um, and then are probably stretched a bit too far and may be forced to sell out of the market which may present some opportunities at that point in time but um, we do see some some pressure in that space on the pricing side but that's that could be a good thing for those that haven't been able to get into the market that uh that may give them a chance to enter into the market because usually most people are buying into the property space for the longer term. Um, and if you can find that that purchase price with a bit that's a bit softer than what it, or a bit lower than what it was a few months ago, I think a lot of people will take that. But the, the concern there is watching where interest rates go as well, uh, making sure that you've got a lot of capacity to service that debt. Um, and I think that's where some people may be a bit stretched as we go through the cycle because it has increased a lot further than people thought. I mean, only six months ago, a bit over eight months ago, Philip Lowe, the Reserve Bank Governor, was saying we're not going to see rates rise until at least 2024. And here we are. We've had a number of rate rises and expecting more to come. Uh, and we're in mid-2023. So I think that's caught a few people by surprise and that'll continue to see some, some pressure on the pricing of the property side of things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, recent reports I've read show that you know Sydney property prices are off five percent from peak. Yeah, you know, Melbourne sort of heading up towards four, and Brisbane now just started to sort of tick over uh, and, and trend down a little bit. So that you know a little bit behind the, the bigger markets, but no jokes. Um, <laughs> it was too obvious, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> um, but I, I guess the, the, the upside of, of decreased property prices is you pay a little bit less stamp duty. Um, but to your point, if you've if you've got to borrow money to do that, then you might pay a little bit less, but it might cost you as much to hold that through to the way of interest carry costs and those types of things. Um, we've actually our next property, our next webinar uh, this time next month, we will have um, Ramon Cura, who's a property buyer's agent. So we're going to focus that on, uh, as we said, the hot topic of residential property. So if you want to know more about that, Ramon will have lots of insight. Um, but you know, from my viewpoint, I think it, it looks like there might be some opportunities for people who are looking to invest in property over the next 12 or 18 months uh, with prices coming off. And we always talk about, you know, when, when prices come off in, in shares, it's a good time to buy. Uh, same goes for property. And in some ways, it's easier for property because it's, it's not as volatile uh, going up and down. Um, and I think we've, to... also, we've also seen some... some strong increases in the rental side of things to, to match with those increases that we've seen on the pricing side and trying to see that 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 um, those numbers got a bit out of whack there where you did see pricing considerably higher than where you would expect the rent to be from a percentage perspective and so that's obviously got to catch up and will come back into line and that's when you start to see prices be more um, fair value. Absolutely. Um, any other comments in regards to what we see next with regards to cash, bonds or equities? No, look, I think the main thing we can, we continue to do in our portfolios is we'll always look at the, the options that are out there, but we try to st stay true to label. Um, we make sure that we reweight every single quarter um, just to take 
some risk off the table by selling out of those sectors that have run hard and others that have, haven't done as well, just smooths the returns over the longer term. Um, means that you don't find you end up with a portfolio that's skewed towards shares when shares have been rallying hard um, and only looking to hit, get a big, bigger downside, obviously, when you go through that period. Um, that's the, the main thing is obviously uh, uh, retiree clients are going to be happier to see a bit of, bit of a return in the cash part of their portfolios, which they haven't seen for a while now. Um, and then the bond space, I think the interesting part there will be just watching that space going forward as to what rates are going to do, because we've already seen that uh, the longer dated bond um, sector start to turn a little bit on the upside, indicating that maybe rates are going to be pushed a little bit too high and then actually have to come back down. And so there may be an opportunity there for bonds to get a bit more of that, that money back uh, that's been lost in the short in the short term. I mean, really with bonds, as long as you hold your bond to maturity and the companies or governments that you're invested into a good solid backing, uh, you should get your full value back anyway. So it's a time frame thing. So for us, the bond sector, whilst we did make the call to move to out of the passive and into the active to help protect downside, ultimately it's still a safer sector to be investing in over the long term. But being safer, you generally aren't getting as big as larger returns or larger potential outcome as well. And just touch on that again, not not uh, asking for too much crystal ball gazing, but. Um... You know, what are the expectations for returns? Are, are we, you know, are we predicting a little bit more red? Are we predicting, you know, massive big green numbers to follow what we've been through? Or, or how are you sort of seeing what might happen over the next six and 12 months? I think research from uh, the providers we have is, is saying it's a time to be cautious. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, you look at China with those property problems that they've got. You've got the war in Russia and Ukraine. Um, you've got the... Central Bank, who are trying to chase their tails now, catch up on the inflation piece and, and increasing rates, and, and they could push rates too far, and that could mean that we, we might see a bit of a slowdown. So I think it's just time to be cautious. Um, again, as, as we talked about always, being, we're looking at investing for the long term. We don't know what's going to happen in the short term. It's hard to uh, predict that, but being cautious uh, right now is, is a stance that we, we don't mind. Um, and that's what we're looking at the portfolio is just making sure that we've got the right managers in place to manage through this this next part of the cycle. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. It's definitely, you know, asset, most asset classes are cheaper than they were uh, six months ago. So the, the, there's opportunities out there, but there's probably no need to be racing in now, fearing mm -hmm. that you're going to miss out. So don't let the FOMO get the better of you. Um, be cautious and, uh, and patient and, and um, make sure you're sticking to your plan and taking that long-term focus is always important. Um, so we've got about two minutes to go. Is there any anyone, any questions um, that anyone has? Now's a good time to uh, send those through. Otherwise, we'll, we'll start to wrap up and I'll give Mark the chance for the last word while we're waiting for any questions that may be out there. Well, you won't like the last word, Jeff. It was well done to the Queenslanders in the state of origin. <laughs> yeah. That was just another, you know, dagger in the uh, heart of, of a tough six months to finish off that period with uh, <laughs> another loss. So, yeah, not that much fun. Um, okay, looks like Mark's covered off everything everyone wanted to know, which is great. So um, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. As I said, next month we've got a uh, um, more focus on... Uh, I've just got one comment coming through. That's thank you for your insights. No problem. Um, more deep dive into uh, property, residential property. So if you're interested in, in that space, then um, tune into that one. Watch out for the uh, invites coming out shortly. Um, but otherwise, I'll just say thank you very much, Mark, for your time and your insights and uh, your preparation to, to make sure you uh, had covered off all those, those areas. Appreciate your thoughts and, and the ongoing work of the Investment Committee. Well, thanks for hosting it all, Jeff. No worries. And uh, everybody home, thanks for your attention. And uh, if you have any, any questions to follow up, uh, please get in touch with your advisor or, or send a note through to Mark and I. But otherwise, have a great day. See Thank you. you. Goodbye.